Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're starting the last module of this course, which is a module devoted towards spectroscopy and sensors. This week, week seven, we'll be discussing spectroscopies, and next week, just a little bit on electrochemical sensors. So what I want to do in, the, in these sets of lectures is really introduce you to both infrared and ultraviolet visible absorption spectroscopy. They're very different in the kinds of information they provide, but from an instrumental perspective, a lot of parallels. Then we'll talk about interpreting both of these kinds of spectra. They're going to be important for your very last case study on breathalyzers. And apologies, it's not your sound. Uh, I have a bad cold right now, so <clears throat> my voice is a little off. Anyhow, let's get started. So in this first overview lecture, I really just want to un go over some of what we talked about before with atomic spectroscopies. How does light interact with matter again? How we collect spectra, the ways in which they're displayed, and kind of some basics about the units that we use, and then some typical infrared and UV vis spectra that you might encounter in analysis. So the goal of any spectroscopy is to form or create a spectrum. And what a spectrum means scientifically in this sense is a graph which shows on the x-axis wavelength, and that's wavelength of light. So that's going to be the photons that are going to interact with your sample. And then the y-axis is going to be some measure of how much light was taken away from the beam, if it's an absorption spectroscopy. And in this case, on over here, you see an infrared spectrum, and you can see that the x-axis in this case is actually infrared light. And on the right over here, you see an optical spectrum of cobalt, and now we have molar absorptivity as our y-axis. So in infrared, you typically use transmittance on the y-axis, and on UV-Vis, you'll use molar absorptivity, both of which we'll define in today's lecture and the next. So remember, the x-axis of the spectra is going to be the wavelength, and the y-axis is going to be how much was absorbed. So let's go over some basics about electromagnetic radiation. You've seen this graph before a couple of weeks ago, but it's super important because one of the things you need to know as an analyst is when you're looking at a data set, what type of light that was used to probe the sample, and that tells you a lot about what kinds of information you're going to get out. So what we're focusing on today is the part of the spectrum that's in the visible and the infrared. And so in the visible regime, it's going to be 180 to about 800 nanometers. And typically, the shorthand way of describing that is UV-Vis spectroscopy. That's going to be code for optical absorption spectroscopy. Then infrared can be a broader range. There's both near-infrared and mid-infrared, where mid-infrared is really the traditional range that you operate in. <clears throat> and that's much, much longer wavelengths from about 0.8 to 50 microns. Really, the operating range is a little bit narrower than that, but again, a pretty broad range for infrared. So as you can see, when you do UV-Vis, you're working with very short wavelength light. And then as you go to the infrared, much longer wavelengths. And that's going to actually change how molecules interact with those two different very types of light. Okay, uh, a little bit about units. As you recall, the x-axis of these spectra are going to be in terms of photon energy. That can be given to you as wavelength. That's pretty conventional. But sometimes you'll see it in units of wave numbers, which is 1 over wavelength, sometimes written as lambda bar. And the convention in that is to always put it in centimeters to the minus 1. And you may also see it written as EV, which we'll talk less about because that typically is more of a physics unit. So just to remind you, the wavelength of the light is just thinking about a wave. It's the difference between the two crests of the wave. And the other thing I'll point out is that you'll really use different kinds of ranges of wavelength when you give your spectra. So for example, in UV-Vis, it's conventional to always have your x-axis in terms of nanometers, whereas in infrared spectroscopy, it's convention to always put it in terms of microns. Of course, you can convert them if you want, but if you're interpreting those data sets or preparing your data, just realize that those are what people would expect to see for both IR and UV-Vis spectroscopy. So I want to do a couple of examples of converting units. If you're given something about the wavelength, can you convert it to joules? Joules is going to be the standard energy unit that we would use. Maybe rare you'll have to do this, but I just wanted to show you how to approach it. So first of all, since we have 500 nanometers, we can go back and look at the spectrum uh, that I gave you of all the electromagnetic radiation and realize that it falls in the ultraviolet visible portion. So that's the type of spectroscopy this is going to be. It's going to be a UV vis. And as you'll see in a moment, that means it's going to be interacting with the electronic states of molecules. And then to do the conversion, you just apply the formula from the last page. HC over lambda. You may not know where to get those constants H and C. They're pretty standard physics constants. One is called Planck's constant, the other is the speed of light, and they're shown right here. 
And so you simply just do a quick mathematical calculation. You get 3.98 times 10 minus 19 joules. Then I have another quick question, which is actually pretty relevant for your last case study, which is what happens if somebody gives you wavelength in microns, but you want it in wave numbers. This is a really common thing because a lot of chemists, when we're doing the analysis of molecules, we're really trained to think in terms of wave numbers. Whereas if you're an analytical chemist, um, you may just be doing everything in terms of microns. So inverting that in your head is hard. So I'm always doing this calculation. So what you do to get wave numbers from a wavelength is you just take the one over. Just bear in mind that the typical units that wave numbers are provided in are inverse centimeters. Again, just a convention. So in this case, the 3.4 micron peak that we're interested in is at 2941 wave numbers. And likewise, the other one, the lower wavelength peak is at 1052. So let's talk a little bit about UV vis and infrared with respect to why do molecules interact with light in these ranges of wavelengths with respect to incoming energy. And the reason is really goes back to atomic spectroscopy. When you have a molecule, your electrons are in quantized molecular orbitals. They can't exist at every energy possible. So when they jump from one orbital to the other orbital, they absorb light. So as you see here, what I'm showing you is an elect two electronic transitions. One is E1, one is E2, and you can see that they both correspond to the transition from one electronic state to another. If you were to translate into what does that change look like in an absorption spectrum, you would get this kind of data, which shows you two peaks where at lambda 2, it was absorbing the light of that higher energy transition, and lambda 1 absorbing the light for the lower energy transition. And so when you see a peak in the spectrum, an absorbent spectrum, you know that light was taken out of the beam, and therefore it was used to change the electronic states, in this case, of the molecular orbitals that the electrons inhabit. So one of the consequences of the way that UV-Vis works and these electronic transitions of molecules is that if you're in the gas state, as we were in atomic spectroscopy and everything is gaseous, you'll actually see pretty sharp lines on the peaks and they'll be very, very narrow. And the reason that they have what's called the fine structure is, as we're going to talk about in a second, basically vibrational modes. But you can also clearly see the very distinct electronic transitions between different orbitals of the molecule. However, what often happens in UV-Vis, particularly in water, is the interactions with the solvent molecules themselves smear out those energy levels, so much so that you lose the very particular features and you tend to get broad, blobby peaks. So most UV-Vis data consist of broad, blobby peaks. That means you won't see a lot of individual transitions, but you'll see one giant peak that has a maximum wavelength, in this case around 540 nanometers. So what that means from a functional perspective is that it turns out uv -vis is not great for molecular fingerprinting. If you don't know the species you have, uv -vis is probably not the technique you're going to use. It's not a great qualitative tool. Now, I will amend that by saying we saw an example last week in an HPLC system which took optical data off of what was coming off of the column, and they actually had libraries of big blobby UV-Vis, and they tried to match it up to the library. So when you're doing a separation and you have a really pure substance and you get a broad blobby peak, particularly if you have more than one, you might be able to use a library database to kind of match 15,000 different spectra and figure out what you have. But typically UV-Vis is not our go-to method if you want to know what's the chemical formula for the thing that's giving me this absorption. Where it is useful is in quantitative analysis, as you'll see in the next lecture. Now, infrared is a totally different kind of interaction with light. So what you see here in E0, E1, and E2 are those electronic levels we talked about before. But every time you have an electronic transition, it turns out the molecule can also have different vibrational modes in which the atoms are actually changing their physical position relative to one another. And these are some examples of the types of vibrations you can get. You can get a symmetric vibration, an asymmetric. And there's this great website I'm going to take you to just so you can see it in motion. This is the Wikipedia site for dancing molecules. And as you can see here, really what's going on in vibrational spectroscopy is you're actually changing the position of the atoms relative to one another. And that's causing light to be absorbed. But now the light is much lower frequency because it's a lot easier, for example, to just twist these molecules than it is to force the electrons that inhabit those black bars to change their energy states. In any case, the fact that 
vibrational modes of molecules are quantized means that we find in the infrared spectra very, very well-defined peaks. So this is an example of such a thing. So in this IR spectra, first of all, it's inverted. If you turned it upside down and took the log, you would have absorbance. But normally, it's shown as a percent transmission. So when you have transmittance that's close to zero, that means a lot of absorbance. And of course, transmittance closest to 100%, not much absorbance at all. And each of these peaks corresponds, in this case, in toluene, to very particular motions of atoms. So when you have a molecule, you can describe all of what's called it, or called its normal modes. And each of those normal modes has a very particular frequency, kind of like when a bell rings, you might hear multiple frequencies. And each of those frequencies tells us something. Ah, we have an aromatic ring that's breathing. Or we may have a CH that's stretching. And so infrared is a really useful fingerprint. And my last lecture of this week, I'll actually give you some hints about how you analyze IR spectra to identify unknowns. But typically when you're doing IR, especially as an analytical chemist, you kind of know what you're looking for. So the key difference is then between UV vis and infrared. IR spectroscopy is more powerful qualitatively for identifying the structural groups on molecules because it measures how the atoms move. So if you have a CH bond, that's going to have a different kind of frequency of motion than if you have a CO bond, for example. And in UV vis, you tend to get these broad blobby peaks because those electronic energy levels of molecules, because of interactions with solvents, most typically spread out in both the solution and the solid state. So however, because it's really a clean relationship between concentration and absorbance. You can use UV vis very nicely to do quantitative analysis in a way that infrared, for a whole bunch of reasons we won't go into, is not so good quantitatively. So they're kind of complementary tools. And both end up measuring the spectrum of samples. Now, of course, the final difference I'll note between the two is the convention for the y-axis. As spectroscopies, they're changing the wavelength of the light incident on the sample, and they're measuring how much gets absorbed. But for a variety of probably historical reasons, when you report a UV vis for optical absorption, electronic transitions, your y-axis is almost always molar absorptivity, which we're going to define in the next lecture. But if you're doing infrared, you're going to be reporting percent transmittance. So they kind of look like the inverse of each other when you see the spectrum. Anyhow, I hope that's giving you an overview of both optical and infrared spectroscopy. Thanks so much, and see you next time.